Good morning, everybody. We're ready to start our session with Tram from A to Better. A distributed marketplace for carbon. It rewards individuals with digital tokens every time they make a good, more sustainable decisions on their daily trips. It empowers people to take the world from A to Better by making every trip count. Let's welcome the Tram team. Good morning, everybody. Um, it is our pleasure to be here this morning with all of you. We're super happy, excited to be able to uh, introduce STRAM to this community, this amazing community that is trying to make the world a better place just like all of us are um, really thriving to do here. So it's really, really um, a great opportunity for us to be able to share um, what we have been doing in the last uh, year with, with all of you tonight. So with all of you this morning, um, so we are going to uh, start with the manifesto, which is a video that we had put together to be able to show you how we feel about the challenge, how we feel about the community we're trying to build. We will share the video with you as a starting point, and then um, we will be able to share a presentation on how we see our company evolving. And at the end, we will go back to the video to see if your feelings have changed throughout the morning. So um, thank you for being here with us. Um, this morning and uh, let's let's get going economic power cultural power powers that feel bigger than us but there's another power that is big enough to overthrow them. People power. The one generated by collective action and multiplied by everyday trips on the go. Walking. Taking a train. An e-bus. A bike. Or driving an electric car. It all counts. Our collective action counts. Tram is here to make the way you move every day reduce your carbon footprint. And you know, with great power comes great value. Because every trip generates digital tokens. The more people make their power count, the bigger our community gets. The sum of billions multiplied by their everyday actions is pure and simple. People power. The power can stop climate change and make us move from A to better. Now more than ever, with Tram, every trip counts. you um have you have you thought about how many times uh do you travel every day have you thought about how many how many trips do you take every day you you travel to go to school you got travel to go to work you travel to go to um supermarket you travel to uh take your kids to practice uh you know you travel to go see your friends um you travel to do the things that you like and you travel to do sometimes the things that you don't like. But we live in a world that is constantly moving. And, and that energy and that, and that need for us to be moving all the time, moving everywhere, it's, uh, it's something that will continue to be part of our lives throughout. And, and that's something that we have gotten to use to do every day. But have you thought how many times do you take a vehicle to do this? Does, does everyone here probably owns a vehicle, probably knows somebody that owns a vehicle. Those vehicles are part of our lives. 
those vehicles have been part of our lives for a very long time. And unfortunately, those vehicles are part of the challenge. So we need to think about this in, in a way that every trip counts. And we're very serious about this. Because if we take in consideration those many, many trips that all of us take every day to go from point A to point B, and everybody that we know is doing the same thing, when you add up, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal, and I'm, I'm going to talk to you um, about why we think we have an opportunity to improve things, to make things better for everyone, um, in, in, in not only in this auditorium, but to actually make things better for society. One of the challenges that we have, and this is a personal challenge to me, I have three teenage kids, and one of the challenges that I think we have is that when we talk about climate change, when we talk about the environment, when we talk about sustainability, a lot of people do not relate to it. And not only that, but a lot of people do not think that's something cool or, some, or something that they want to be part of. That's my own reality. When I asked my kids last Thanksgiving, last November, when I asked my kids what they thought about this idea, what they thought about the concept of this company that we are building with an incredible and talented group of people that come from different parts of the world, I was super excited to tell them and, and to share with them what we were working on. And their reaction was like, eh, boring. At some point, somebody, I think, said even stupid. And, and, you know, and that is my own personal reality, which means that my kids, run, they don't really care about the environment. And I'm not ashamed to say that, but that's how I feel. Fast forward six months from now, I think they're actually starting to pay attention. And I think their, their, minds, their minds have shifted in a really positive way. It has taken some time, but I think now they start to get it. And not only that, but now they start to think I'm cool again which is super important to me. Because my, the last company that I worked with that I had the privilege and, you know, to, to be able to be part of was developing self-driving vehicle technology. And my kids thought I was the coolest dad ever. They wouldn't stop talking about my, me or my company to their friends. I felt that. I felt that I was super cool. I'm a cool dad. I'm doing cool things. And then when I shifted into the environment and sustainability, it, it, something changed. Again, the uh, was kind of very present. So I think that a challenge that we all have here and a challenge that we have as a society, which is key and super important for all of us, is that we have to turn um, the challenge of climate change into something cool, into something appealing for society, for everyone to, be, to, be, to, to want to be part of. So I'll just give you one more example and I'll move on. High school, US, where, where I live. I live here in Miami, I'm part of an incredible community. But when I ask certain kids and about you know, some of the concepts and some of the technology that we are developing and ask, ask for feedback just to see what the reaction is, what the reaction is one thing that comes um, as, as, as a reality is that a lot of the kids I'm talking about high school level, but a lot of the kids that get involved with things like the environment, sustainability, climate change, and so on and so forth, they're not considered cool kids. In many cases, they're considered weird. They're considered meh. You know, the extracurricular activities that have a relation or have something to do with the environment is not usually seen, seen as something cool. And this is something that it repeats itself throughout many communities around the world. And I'm saying this in a positive way because I do believe we have a huge opportunity to turn that around. All of you guys here, I mean, I see the auditorium, there's very cool people here. Really cool, creative, amazing, talented people. And I think a very exciting challenge that we all have is to turn this into something appealing. We need to think about how to turn this into something cool because the more we do that, and if we succeed at that, even at a fraction of whatever that means, I think we're going to get much more people involved into, into, into being part of the solution. And that's part of what Trump is trying, trying to, to, to do. Um, I think everyone recognizes that we have a challenge. We have a huge challenge. Um, you know, if, if you look at the U.S. where we are now, um, 
numbers, the numbers are, the, you know, data is data, the numbers are the numbers. We can debate a little bit here and there, but reality is that it, within the sector that we are focusing on, 29%, almost one third of emissions, emissions come from transportation, which to us, it's a very, very appealing opportunity. Because if we succeed at tackling within, at tackling this specific sector, and we succeed at doing our job and, and getting people on board to try to improve one third of it, we're basically solving one third of the problem, or at least a, a big proportion of one third of the problem, which is a lot when we start to add up the numbers. So our opportunity here, and what we are going to be focusing on is to, 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 to tackle into the one third first. What, to tackle into transportation as a means to reduce carbon footprint. The numbers are huge. As I mentioned, the numbers are really, really large. Um, just some examples in the US alone, there's about 500 billion trips that people take on a yearly basis. That's a really, really large number. It's, it's very difficult to relate to those kind of numbers, but that is our reality. And the good news is that 80% of those trips today are basically taken on a vehicle. And I say good news because we have a huge opportunity to improve these numbers. We have a huge opportunity to change the patterns and to do something here. And we believe that you know we're, we're up to something extremely meaningful and interesting. Um, last example, 50% of those trips that I just uh, mentioned are very short trips within one to five miles. And if you think about it, wherever you come from, if, you know, you might come from Latin America, you might come from some parts of Europe. If you think about it, most of the trips that you do on, a, on your daily lives are, the, are, are very short trips, one to five miles. That is, that is a reality for everyone, which means that we have a really great opportunity to be able to improve this. We don't really need to take our vehicles to go on a two mile trip, but we do every day because it's just something that we are used to. And, I, and, and we believe as a team and we believe as a company that we have a huge opportunity to be able to, 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 to make a change, a very positive change. We have been working on um, developing what we call the circular economy, which doesn't exist today, and which we believe it's, 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 it's something that we can um, do, and it's something that we're working really, really hard to be able to achieve. So when you think about all of us as a community, when you think about all of us as a society and the way we move around, um, and, the, and, and, the, and the challenge to be able to reduce carbon footprint, um, so why would we do that? Why would we make a change? You know, and, and people are driven by incentives. That's the way human beings are. So if we can find the right economic, societal, and moral incentives to be able to drive change, then we might really generate the value that we're seeking for. And we're doing do that through generating this circular economy where each one of us takes a decision, makes an effort, goes the extra mile to, 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 to take a sustainable trip to be able to go to point A to point, from point A to point B in a, in a much more sustainable way. And every time you do that, you will receive a digital token for that effort. That digital token is gonna to be attached to specific value based on the distance of the trip, based on how sustainable the trip is, and based on all the data that we are generating every day with a device that we carry with us every single moment of our lives, almost. That device that we're carrying with us every day in the form of a smartphone has enormous computing capacity. And it has a set of sensors that provide us with enough opportunity to be able to process all that data and to be able to determine how sustainable someone's trip is. And so when you get that digital token, that belongs to you now because you are the owner of that action and it goes into your digital wallet and you start to accumulate those tokens by generating those positive actions that allow you to accumulate more tokens and so on and so forth. And then on the other side of the marketplace are the companies. The companies around the world that have an enormous uh, responsibility to comply for their carbon emissions, for what they do as a company. And that effort is going to continue to grow because society today 
governments, corporations, public and private sector is aware of the fact that it has to continue to be regulated. It has to continue to be part of what we do as a society, which means that there's more and more companies that seek for ways to be able to reduce their emissions. And today, there's a shortage in what we call offsets, which is the other side of the equation. There is a shortage for companies to be able to discover and find these kind of solutions. And there's a lot of efforts from many different companies trying to figure out what are the right projects to be able to offer these companies to be able for these companies to offset. And that will continue to be the case, which is a great thing. But our, our theory and the reason of our existence is that for the first time, we're bringing the individual as part of the equation, all of us here. Because we believe that this is not about the corporations or the governments. This is about people. This is about people power, like our manifesto was mentioning. This is about all of us making the change. And so what we believe in is that if we can all imagine having a digital wallet that it's part of our daily lives, where every time we take the right decision is, is rewarding us with some form of digital value, then we believe we have an opportunity to generate the scale that we need for people to start to be part of the equation massively. For people to start to be part of the equation everywhere in the world. For people to be able to contribute to this anywhere you are, every time you move. So if you look at this mock-up here, you know, this is what a digital wallet could potentially look like, right? I, am, I live here in Miami and you know, these are certain sustainable modes that I can take every time I travel. And so if I take a bicycle, that could be the equivalent of you know, three tokens for each mile. If I walk five tokens, if I take an electric vehicle, one token. If I take an electric bus as part of a public transportation system, it's one token and so on and so forth. So then you can imagine a trip. You know, I took a trip where I live. I took a trip from my home to, um, to the school. And that trip was five minutes long, five minutes long, 1.4 miles. I took that trip on an electric golf cart, which happens to be sustainable. And so I was awarded one token for that trip. What my effort was not dramatic. The effort that I had to take to decide that I wanted to take that electric golf cart instead of taking my internal combustion engine vehicle was something I could manage to do. And then I got a token. And so that week, I went from home to the office, to the, from the office back home, from home to the park, from the park to the gym, from the gym to the friend's house and so on and so forth. But, and that week, all the sustainable trips that I took awarded me with 48 tokens. And so every time I'm taking the right decisions, every time I am thinking about being more sustainable and more responsible within my travel behavior, I'm getting rewarded with tokens. That a company on the other side, a corporation, hundreds of potential corporations will be more than happy to buy. So you can imagine a company like Nike buying my digital tokens because they do have to offset, they do have budget that they have to fulfill. But instead of Nike thinking about, you know, some valuable projects, forestation project in the Amazon basin where Nike has to make an, a certain invest in, investment and Nike will you know, comply for the part of their offsets by investing in this project, which is certified by you know, several agencies and certified by certain processes and so on and so forth. That's what exists today. And more or less, that's how the industry, quote unquote, has evolved since you know, the, the Kyoto Protocol. But now imagine Nike being able to comply for a certain part of those emissions by buying the tokens directly from their own customers. And on top of that, Nike will provide a customer with a coupon with, of a discount for their next pair of shoes, which people are using to take the walk, to do the bicycle ride, to do sustainable, uh, to have some more sustainable behaviors using Nike products. Nike will love to be part of a marketplace like this because it makes sense, because it helps to solve for the equation in a way that doesn't exist today 
and in a way that allows a company like Nike to get closer to their customers in a much more meaningful way. And the good news is that this is possible today. This is feasible, and we're building this. And we're building this based on blockchain. And we're building this based on data. And data doesn't lie. Data is precise. Data is accurate. So we can't cheat. That is the beautiful part of this, is that it's all up to us, and it's all up to our decisions. And the demand for this type of solutions is really big today. Really, really big. Companies are desperately seeking for new solutions on how they tackle climate change. And that's what Tram is focusing on. If I asked any of you guys 12 years ago, 12 years ago, if I asked someone here in the auditorium, if you are going on your next trip to um, Rome, you should stay in a, in a stranger's apartment. You should do that. You know, you're going to Rome. It's, you know, it's, it's your summer vacation. You're going there with your loved one. And I would have told you, you should try to rent someone, someone's apartment, somebody that you've never met. You should stay in that person's house. Most of you would have thought I'm crazy or I don't know what I'm talking about or maybe I'm a psycho or maybe I'm going to do something bad. Because none of us would have thought about that possibility. Only 12 years ago, not 20, not 30, 12 years ago, none of us here would have thought it would be imagined to rent a stranger's apartment anywhere in the world and for someone to rent our homes or our properties as something normal. Only 12 years ago, nobody would have thought that would be possible. Today, there are companies that are part of what we call the shared economy that are part of our daily lives. We don't doubt it. We love these companies. We use them every day, almost. And they have become part of society in a way that they have helped us to do things in ways that we didn't imagine before. And so... This is extremely important to us as a company because we do believe that one of the first things that we have to um, learn from the world that we live in today is that the amazing and fantastic technologies that we have available today allow us to think about the impossible. The number one lesson that we need to learn from the technological developments that we have achieved as a society is to believe, is to believe that things are possible, is to believe that we can change the way we live, is to believe that we can change the way we do things and patterns and, 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 and things that we thought were, didn't make any sense. It is extremely important that we keep this in mind because this is what's going to allow us to make the change that we're all seeking for. This is what's going to allow us for us to be better. We really believe in this as a company because we think it's possible. Can we imagine living in a world like Mario? Some of us really love Mario. Mario has been part of our culture for many, many years. And we need to think about this. We need to learn from this. Can we think about a world where every time we're moving around and doing the right thing, and every time we're doing the right thing for the environment, we're getting rewards, we're getting paid for it. Can we imagine a world where we are basically getting paid for doing the right thing? This is what we believe in. And this is what we are building. Because it's possible. Let's think about that as a community. Let's imagine ourselves in a world where we get rewarded for doing the right thing. So we want to plant an idea, and, this, and, and, and as a team, we have been working really, really hard to be able to, to get to this point. We want to plant the idea to all of us here this morning that we can reduce carbon emissions. We can make the world a better place. And at the same time, we can get paid for it. This is a game changer. And this is what we believe in. And this is the reason why TRAM exists today. And we want to introduce this to all of you.
this would not be possible without an incredible and amazing team. And I, I, we are very fortunate to be working with one another. We are working with extremely talented people from many places around the world. And I'm honored and I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to be able to introduce the Trump team to all of you. Ryan? Thank you. Uh, Ryan Chin. I am co-founder and COO of Tram. I am from Boston, Massachusetts. As an American, I realize that America is the number one emitter per capita of emissions. And in order to solve the problem, you have to recognize there is a problem. That's why I'm part of this company. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Alvaro. I'm the European Union Director for, for Trump. And I would just like to invite you to join this community and, and let makes a different make, make us different to, uh, to, together. Good morning. I'm Lakshmi Srinivasan. I come from uh, Chennai, a metropolitan city in India. A uh, coastal city, much like Miami, staring at the potential uh, impacts of climate change. I'm the chief technology officer of Tram. I'm really excited about combined power of blockchain, artificial intelligence, and user experience technology that we can bring in order to induce the behavior change, the shift in our mindset that Ramiro talked about that all of us did by trusting the technology to Uber or Airbnb. I firmly believe that this is possible and it is our right to make every trip count. I'd like to start a question. Why do we travel? Why do we travel? We travel physically to allow us to move from A to B. But more importantly, we travel to express ourselves, to pursue our dreams, to achieve our freedom. Transition technology today allows us to travel faster, travel longer, but with sheer consequence, like Romero pointed out. But with Trump today, every single one of them can travel while reduce carbon can travel with responsibility and travel with pride. I'm Jinghua Zhao from China. I'm the chief scientist and co-founder of Trump Global. Hello, my name is Eduardo. I'm a co-founder and CMO at Trump. My job is basically to make it cool, right? Uh, to make sure <laughs> this is not boring and making sure we bring our experience from the ad world uh, I used to live in London for the last few years. Not a, I guess I'm a Miami boy now. I moved uh, last year here. Um, and we want to make sure that the communications, our go-to-market strategy, and, and the brand becomes part of pop culture, becomes something that you know, your kids, my kids, your kids uh, want to be part of. So, so it, it requires creativity, marketing, communications, and that's my job as a CMO and co-founder. Hi, um, I'm Oscar. I'm from Mexico. I'm a VP of Finance, and I'm just super excited to be partnering with such a great team on this amazing project. Thank you, team. I'm super, super proud to be able to work with you guys on this incredible uh, journey and this incredible challenge. Um, so thank you for you know being part of this. Thank you, guys. Before we finish, I want to ask uh, for two things. Uh, one is that all of you guys register. Uh, you know, be the first ones to, to join the community. Register at tram.global. Be part of this community. Be part of the change and, and get paid for it. Get rewarded for, the, for this. Um, and um, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna show the manifesto again just to see if something in, in your mind changed after, after um, allowing us to share where we are after allowing us to share Trump with you and our vision with you. Um, I would love to have the opportunity for you guys to go through the manifesto again. Um, and thank you. Thank you for, for, for being part of this community and thank you for seeking change. Economic power. Cultural power that feel bigger than us. But there's another power that is big enough to overthrow them. People power. The one generated by collective action and multiplied by everyday trips on the go. Walking. 
a train. And he bumps. A bike. Or driving an electric car. It all counts. Our collective action counts. Tram is here to make the way you move every day. Reduce your carbon footprint. And you know, with great power comes great value. Because every trip generates digital tokens. The more people make their power count, the bigger our community gets. The sum of billions multiplied by their everyday actions is pure and simple. People power. The power can stop climate change and make us move from A to better. Tram team, everybody don't forget to register. Well, today is Climate Tech Day at Premios Verdes. Sustainable development is a priority. As we face this reality, all of our activities for this ninth edition were designed to bring us closer to the change our planet and us as a species need. According to PwC, 14 cents of every dollar of venture capital goes towards climate tech. Welcome to our climate tech conferences. I'd like to remind you that you can find us on social media as Premios Verdes and that all of our activities are streamed on Facebook Live at Premios Verdes. It is now my pleasure to, prevent, to present our next speaker. She's an economist and an award-winning author who served President George W. Bush in the White House and on the National Economic Council. She combines her interests in economy, technology, and geopolitical and geopolitics to start tech companies and advise investors and policymakers. Please welcome economist Pipa Malgram with her title, The Geopolitical Landscape. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me all right? So we're going to talk about geopolitics. And the reason is because, look, we're all here for Premios Verdes for one reason. We want to support all these entrepreneurs who are trying to solve these problems, right? That is what's brought us all together. It's why I joined the advisory board of Premios Verdes. Because at the end of the day, it's actually only these entrepreneurial startups that can solve the real meta problems of our time, like the one we've just heard about. Uh, it's not big corporations that are going to be solving the, the most important, significant problems, particularly related to climate change. But frankly, with regard to pretty much anything, they're in the business of making a lot of money. The people who are going to solve these problems are small entrepreneurs. They generate two-thirds of the net new jobs in most economies. And these days, they generate most of the innovation. And so it's important to understand what's the landscape against which they are trying to build, against which they're trying to solve these huge climate-related problems or problems in their communities. So many of the people that I've met here in the last couple days, the winners of Premios Verdes this year, they're not just focused on climate change. They're also focused on the human element problems in my community that aren't being solved by anyone else. So what's happening on the broader landscape that we need to be thinking about, both as entrepreneurs and as investors supporting them, as communities supporting them? Well, it's a difficult landscape today. Geopolitics is a very heavy, difficult subject. We obviously are in the midst of a significant war in Europe that nobody had really anticipated. We see the superpowers facing off against each other, often in locations that you may not be paying attention to, space, cyberspace, 
the high seas, naval conflicts between the superpowers these days. So what does that mean for all of us in our efforts, for those who are interested in climate change, for those who are interested in helping entrepreneurs? It means the problems are bigger and they're harder. So what do we have to be aware of? Well, I think one thing is actually the message that we just had from Tram. Individual humans are very empowered these days and can solve extraordinary problems. And maybe one thing I realized from talking to the winners here in the last couple days is one thing you need to do is think bigger, much bigger, because your power to do something is so much greater than it's ever been in history. Now, what's a good example of this? Well, in geopolitics, we're seeing a lot of clashing between the superpowers in space. We've had serious incidents like Russian, Chinese, and American satellites facing off. And why do we care? Because, well, you know, GPS, that's why we care, right? Who's gonna dominate the space space influences what's our ability to do things here on the ground. So, for example, the Russians recently blew up a satellite and created a massive debris field. And that created a moment where the International Space Station thought they might have to evacuate to save the astronauts. And what was the purpose of that? It was to be disruptive to the other satellites in those orbits. The Chinese launched a satellite that has a robotic arm, and they used it to pick up a satellite and hurl it into outer space to send the signal that the Chinese could disrupt American satellites at any time. So this is crucial because so many of the things we're involved in won't work if our satellites don't work. In fact, the event that kicked off this modern conflict was in a tiny, tiny little island in the north of Norway where there's an internet cable, a very specific internet cable. It is the fastest internet cable in the world, and it's a double cable. And what is it doing on this tiny little island called Svalbard in the north of Norway? Well, it's where almost every satellite that's less than 5,000 miles high connects to Earth. And so when someone cut that cable in two locations, removing four kilometers in between, that was considered by, for example, the British Chief of Defense Forces as fundamentally to be considered as an act of war. And what was the point? It was to signal the vulnerability we all have to literally the space space. And I see a huge amount of startups in the space arena. It's extraordinary what small little companies are able to do in very far away places. And this is maybe my, one of my best examples of why imagination is actually the most important quality that you can have when you're operating in the startup world. In leaps of imagination are what make things happen. So it turns out there was a very young guy who invented a new kind of microphone. And he felt that this microphone could do really extraordinary things that no microphones had ever done before. And you think, how exciting can a microphone be, right? I'm using a microphone right now. How, what can it really do? Well, it turns out his microphone, and I don't think he was much more than a teenager, was the microphone, have you guys heard the sound of Mars? Right? NASA has been broadcasting what it sounds like on Mars. Well, that was that kid's microphone. It got sent into space. So small ideas can turn into huge outcomes. And this is important in a world where geopolitics is now going to bear down on all of our efforts to make the world a better place. For example, <clears throat> one of the results of the war in Europe that we're seeing, which seems far away from where we are here in Miami, and most of the startups we deal with in Premios Verdes are in the uh, Spanish-speaking world. And yet, it's touching all of our lives. The price of natural gas is up 192% in a year. The price of 
Gasoline is up over 64% in a year. The price of wheat is up 72% in a year. The price of corn, which is a much more significant commodity for this part of the world, is up over 60% in a year. These are inflationary events. And inflation is its own kind of war. Inflation is a war that will affect the poor. Inflation is a war that will affect every single business plan that you guys are putting together. So now you have to think not only what is my amazing idea, but how am I going to make it work against a landscape with higher energy prices? Now the good news for this audience, because you're interested in climate change and you're interested in saving the planet from those particular forces, there is nothing better for you than a high energy price because it means that investment in alternative sources of energy makes sense. And so paying attention to what are the alternative options, that means you have to pay closer attention to the underlying realities. Like you may say, I will use solar panels. Fantastic. Except it turns out a lot of the, uh, a lot of the inputs you need for solar panels, now we have shortages of. So now we're going to have to think more creatively about where are we going to get the solar panels from if there aren't any new ones coming. Now I think that all of us have that imagination and creativity to do this. And there's so many interesting examples of using creativity in ways that are so unexpected. For example, I'll say in the war in Ukraine, our sort of hottest geopolitical spot on the planet right now, you know what's proved to be the most effective, efficient phenomena compared to what the Russians have? So here we have a superpower. The Russians have nuclear weapons, they have tanks, they have aircraft, they have everything a superpower has in its defense arena. And you know what the Ukrainians have been using? Yoga mats. Yoga mats say, what? It turns out yoga mats have a substance in them. If you put it over your head, it blocks the heat signature of the human underneath. And so you can sneak up on the other guy and plant the bombs and they can't see you coming or going. Now that is creative thinking. That is individuals being their own startup to win the war. And that is the kind of creative thinking that these enormous pressures that I'm talking about will compel. Because there is no other way. There is no other solution. The only solution are acts of imagination. Yesterday I was talking to the Premio Sparadays winners, and of course all of them had exactly the same question as all startups do all over the world, which is how can I raise money? And we do live in a world where there's an extraordinary amount of money going around. But part of my answer to them was, I know you think money is the answer, but actually, money will get you only so far. What really gets you somewhere are acts of imagination that others can buy into, can follow, can believe in. Now today, in a world where we're seeing the landscape change in this radical way, it's not enough to think, what is my cool, interesting startup? It's how is it going to affect the community more broadly? And will people be able to use my invention or my idea if they're facing higher rates of poverty in the community because of inflation? This business of thinking about what's the landscape against which I'm operating is absolutely central to success. It's very easy to wake up in the morning and think that just what you read and what you know in your day is the whole picture, but it isn't. And that's why events in far away places like Ukraine, why things like superpower conflict, which seem very far away, are actually central to all of our efforts to solve the problems of our times. Now, the world of geopolitics is immensely complex. And it involves not only nations uh, arguing with each other, 
but we're in a moment of history where technology is actually causing a shift in the balance of power between states and citizens. And we see this in the form of culture wars and information wars and social conflict, which is occurring even more because of the inflation that I described. But there's good news. And that good news is technology is now allowing outcomes we've never seen before. So I'll give you a couple of examples. And they are a geopolitical revolution. They are not just a pure technological revolution. One of them has to do with the invention of digital money. And I see in the future we're going to have two forms of digital money. One will be governments creating their own digital money. They call that CBDC. And the other is crypto. And of course, this community is very interested in crypto, and rightly so. Well, both of them represent the same thing, which is the creation of a completely new form of money and a completely new way of funding all these wonderful ideas and creative efforts. Now, traditionally, when very bright people want to come together to create value and wealth and profits, well, normally, we would have in the past all found people who happen to live in the same town that we live in, and we would have created a company with them. And that company would have issued shares, and investors would buy shares in those companies. And that's how you create Apple, right? Two guys in a garage, great idea, create a company, issue shares. Today, we have a new phenomena. Have any of you heard of the Bored Ape Yacht Club? Right? It's very interesting, actually, how the age affects. Younger people know about it. So as an older person, let me tell older people, this is a very important phenomena because what it represents, it's if I, I would ask you to Google it so you can actually get a visual picture. But the Bored Ape Yacht Club are images of cartoons of apes. And some of them are selling for extraordinary amounts of money, half a million dollars, a million dollars. People say, why are people paying that kind of money for a picture? And the answer is because it's not a picture, it's a community. And that community, you can sell products through it, you can move ideas through it. These are very switched on people who are able to create value and wealth. And as a community, they will not be issuing shares. They are not incorporated. And so the only way to participate is by getting engaged in this world of tokens and crypto and digital money. So why does this matter? Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, how many of you have used Zoom? Right? Everybody's used Zoom since COVID, right? There's a company called Hopin. Hopin is like Zoom, but it has more bells and whistles. Well, Hopin was an idea in 2019. Today, it's worth 8 billion US dollars. Now, what's interesting about Hopin is none of them have ever met. None of them have ever met. They're not in the same place. Number two, they have no headquarters. They're not based anywhere. Now, they are incorporated, but with today's crypto, creation of DAOs and all kinds of mechanisms, you wouldn't need to actually incorporate. Now, if that's the future, well, this is very interesting for national governments because national governments are used to taxing corporations in their community or individuals in their community. What I'm describing is a world where it, the corporation isn't there anymore and all these bright people are coming together and they're digital nomads. They're all over the world. So where is the value? Well, I can tell you, this is going to be a geopolitical fight about where is the value being created and how does it relate to the power of governments or not? And which governments are going to be friendly to this new way of making money and this new way of solving problems, this new way of addressing climate change through imagination, and which ones are not? And I think this is going to shift the location of where is economic activity occurring. Because one person with one laptop today can create $8 billion worth of value in a few years. That's a completely different world than we have ever had before. And that one person with one laptop with one brilliant idea 
can be the one that solves some extraordinary problem. By the way, even the big oil companies, right, those famous Seven Sisters, the Shell Corporations, the BPs of this world, how are they trying to solve problems? How are they trying to be less an emitter and less a, an extractor of energy? They crowdsource. They announce, here's the problem we're trying to solve. Anyone can help us solve this problem. And they reach out to the global community, and you know what? It's working. And some of them have even started to say, actually, we're going to exit this whole space altogether. Countries are doing the same. Saudi and Norway, two of the biggest oil and gas producers in the world, have both said, actually, technology's changed so much, we think we can go to zero. We can literally get out of the oil business. It may take a little bit, but that's the direction of travel. So is that a good thing if you're interested in climate change? I think it is. It would be great if it was faster. How could it be faster? Individuals with brilliant ideas. That's how it's going to happen. So you may feel geopolitics is you know, far away. It's uh, not part of your daily life, and yet it is. It's, it's literally the cradle that holds you in place. So understanding exactly how it's going to touch you will affect what kind of business are you going to create, what kind of solutions will be there, and who's going to invest in your idea. I think another piece of geopolitics has to do with global financing mechanisms. And again, traditionally, individual nations were able to determine what the rules of the game were. The United States, country that I'm from and that I've served in the White House, we always thought, you know, we'll make the rules for global finance. That's the way it will be. Well, it turns out it's changing. And other governments, for example, the government in the United Arab Emirates has said, well, actually, in the digital space, we could produce rules and regulations that would allow crypto and digital to come to life. They don't have to be based here, but we can create the rule system under which they can operate. So suddenly, the Emirates is emerging as a major center for that. By the way, other subjects as well, like DNA sequencing, because they have one of the most diverse populations in the world. Is that shifting the balance of power in geopolitics? Yes. Is it moving more entrepreneurs to that part of the world? Yes. And therefore, should we all be paying attention to which governments are going to make it more friendly, easier to operate when you're in idea creation mode, and which are not? The answer is yes. So we're running a little bit behind schedule this morning, and I'm definitely going to be around uh, for most of today. But I wanted to leave you really understanding that while geopolitics is heavy, it's hard. It's full of awful news at the moment. But all of it's necessary because what you're doing, whatever it is, in the realm of creation will be affected by it. The clients that you're trying to serve will be affected by it and the investors that you're trying to appeal to will be affected by it. So you can no longer afford to look only at what you're doing in your day. You need to consider what's happening on a global scale that might affect what I'm doing. I'll leave you with a positive note. I think that we're in a world that's no longer going to be about scarcity. And so much of geopolitics is driven by scarcity. You have that, and I need it, so I'm going to take it. That's much of what's happening in Ukraine, actually. We are now in a world of ubiquity. We're in a world where scientists are able to create materials from the atomic level up. We're in a world where an individual with a laptop can create an immense amount of value and connectivity. We're in a world where all of you can connect with other entrepreneurs to solve the problems you care about most. So while it's heavy, it's also the beginning of an extraordinary period of history where, frankly, it's not going to be the corporations we're going to be reading about. It's going to be the individuals who were able to navigate the world that I'm describing and bring their ideas to fruition. So with that, I will leave you. And thank you very much for your time.
Deborah, thank you so much for your enlightening uh, talk. We learned so much. I have heard of the board apes. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. uh, and um, we would like to open the floor to just one question. So it's going to be at random and see if anybody has a question that wants to ask Pippa. Yeah, and actually, while you're thinking of a question, I also meant to say, and I just because we're compressed on time, you know, Premios Verdes has partnered with Algorand, uh, and Algorand is a green, the green blockchain. And I don't know if you saw yesterday, but they turned off all the lights in Times Square uh, to show that if you, for one hour, turned all that off, you could uh, mint on their blockchain. Uh, 350 million transactions versus a typical non-green blockchain six. So even in the world of, again, crypto and blockchain, we're seeing unbelievable leaps in capability. And frankly, everybody who's running a business these days, when you're thinking about which blockchain are you going to operate on, I cannot afford to overlook what Algorand is doing to totally revolutionize this space. Yes, great. Mm -hmm. Anybody have a question? Somebody? Over there. Okay. You need to ask again for the interpreter, please. Oh. <laughs> or I can repeat it. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Keep that my question was, what do you see as far as Web3 and DAOs for bringing truth to impact investing and actually valuing impact instead of just focusing on return on investment? Uh, so uh, another feature of modern times is we're in an era of radical transparency. So the old approach where, for example, in the greenwashing discussion, corporations could say, we have a green policy. Yay. <laughs> and then everybody accepted that because there were no metrics. There was no, you know, like handrail. Now, because of the transparency, people say, show me. Show me exactly what you're doing. And so DAOs and all these other stru strategies, structures, will bring this radical transparency. And I think that people are going to be surprised to see how much more work they need to do to actually be uh, in the right place. So the answer is, again, this is a massive opportunity. Massive opportunity before you can make huge progress. So um, it's it's good news. Great. Okay. Thank you so Thank much, you. Pippa. Again, your words. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Your words have been so enlightening. Okay, everybody, we're ready to continue with our next talk. As Miami's 43rd mayor. Mr. Suarez is committed to building a Miami that welcomes everyone. He has championed the integration of climate adaptive technologies, building practices and economic policies across all facets of government as part of his Miami Forever plan. Under his leadership, under his leadership Miami has cut crime and taxes to one of their lowest points in over 50 years, spurring an economic resurgence. Most recently, he championed the development of Miami's tech, economic, tech, tech economy through Venture Miami and investments that connect education and job training to Miami's new emerging economic sectors, such as FinTech, MedTech, and GreenTech. Please welcome the City of Miami Mayor, Francis Suarez. morning. How's everyone feeling today? Tomaron su cafecito cubano. Ojalá. Eh, yo creo que voy a hablar parte en inglés, parte en español. Y en realidad no preparé nada, que es lo mejor eh, en mi experiencia. Eh, lo menos que preparo, lo mejor que sale. Así que, for me, it's just really an honor and a privilege to be here in Premios Verde. Uh, I actually didn't prepare anything today, and, and that's I become by design. Cuando uno después de 12 años en la política y cuando yo doy cinco, seis, siete discursos diarios, lo menos que uno prepara lo mejor porque uno puede recibir la energía de de ustedes, eh, ideas que me vienen en el momento, y entonces puedo especificar lo que quiero discutir 
al momento en vez de algo preprogramado. Um, it's really actually a, a bit of a strategy on my part after being 12 years in public service and uh, uh, speaking almost three, four. I just came from another one. I'm, you know, I probably have another one later today. Um, it, it actually is better because you're in the moment. You're, you're feeding off the energy of the crowd and you're taking the little nuances of little things that you pick up two, three, four minutes before you get on stage and it allows you to connect. So first of all, it's a huge honor and privilege uh, to be here with you today um, and Premio Verde. And I think what's important in the particular context that we're here is that it's about action. You know, uh, you know what has been my action as a mayor of a major metropolitan city in the United States? Well, first, uh, I was named to be the chair of the Environment Committee for the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And I'll tell you a funny story about it. We had... Uh, young people picketing every Friday outside of City Hall. This is a true story. And I w one day I went out there because every Friday they were out there. And, I, you know, they're students and they're picketing and, they, you know, and then some of them were blaming the mayor for this, that, or the other. So I went out there and I said, well, what's going on, guys? How can I help? And like, oh, you know, Mr. Mayor, you know, you're not taking this climate seriously enough. And I said, well, you know, I, I am the chair of the Environment Committee for all of the mayors in the country. And, you know, we are dedicating $200 million of, of voter-approved resources uh, to a Miami that's here forever, not just for you, but for your grandchildren. But, you know, what's on your mind? And they said, well, you have, to, you have to declare a climate emergency. You have to. And so I thought about it, and I got a little scared because I said, you know, I, w w what am I saying, right? Like, what's the projection here, right? Am I telling my the world, like, hey, don't come to Miami. There's a climate emergency. There's, there's a problem, right? And so from a branding perspective, I was like, uh-oh, you know, this, this, I'm not so sure about this. But I started thinking about it, and I had my annual conference of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and I'm telling this story for a reason because it, it sort of connects with how the generations are seeing this issue, right? Maybe in my generation, which is the post-boomer generation, maybe this is top five issue for us. But for the generation that comes after me, this is number one. This is issue number one, before anything else. So I go to this conference in, uh, in, in, in the middle of the summer, and I'm the chair of this committee, and I've been thinking about what these, these kids have been telling me. You know, we gotta, there's a climate emergency. How do, we, how, do we, how do we accelerate the action? So spontaneously, at the committee that I chair, I asked all the mayors of the United States to declare a climate emergency, right? And it passed unanimously. So I came back to Miami, and I was very excited. I was very enthusiastic. And, of course, it's another Friday, and, of course, the kids are out there, and they're protesting again. But this time I had ammunition, right? I was pumped. And so I, I, I go up to them, and I say, you know, guys, I got great news. You know, I was, in, I was in this conference, and I'm the chair of the Environment Committee for the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and I put, you know, a climate emergency that you were asking me for. Yeah, we, we, did it, we did it nationally. We did a national climate emergency. And they looked at me, and they said, but you haven't done it in Miami yet. I was like, oh, my God. So I, I think the lesson is twofold. One is that is the generation's number one issue. And number two, they want an intense and comprehensive solution now. They want it right now. And I think what's uh, amazing about Premio Verde is that they focus on action. They focus on uh, the innovation that is happening now, that is transforming our, our world now, that is making us more sustainable now. Uh, and I see Fran from Climate Coin here and, and the Climate Coin team. Um, and, and it's just exciting to me to be affiliated with companies uh, that are presenting today solutions at scale, macro solutions, uh, that are going to help us get to a carbon-free future. And so, uh, you know, when, when we look at the sort of technologies, I was just walking in the door and these young ladies came up to me with this incredibly cool carbon capture technology, right? And, and we're going to see carbon exchanges uh, revolutionize how ESG is is becomes part of the corporate fabric of our society. Um, it's exciting uh, to see this innovation uh, being done in ways that are on the blockchain and that are uh, you know that are accountable and that are audible auditable, so that we know that what the promises that we're making we're delivering. 
And, you know, I, I, I'll, t- I'll share with you another story. I got nine minutes and 19 seconds. I love telling stories. I realized one of the most powerful ways to communicate is to tell stories. Uh, and my dad the other day, who, my, and my dad's story is fascinating. My dad is a ninth of 14 kids, came to this country at 12, didn't speak any English, got a full scholarship to high school, full scholarship to college, two graduate degrees from Harvard, has written eight books and speaks five languages. And so the other day he says to me, you know, son, I'm really worried about your crypto stance. This is a true story. And, you know, it's because, you know, I, I'm afraid for your political career in the future, you know, and, and, and the environment. And, you know, I, I said to him, Dad, you know, I, as smart as you are, and he, my dad is a genius, as smart as you are, you don't understand the issue completely. Because in Miami, we like to say that the environment is the economy, right? It's not one or the other. We're not picking the environment or the economy. We don't have that luxury. Our environment is our economy. They're one and the same. They're unified, right? There, there, there is no, di- there's no discrepancy. There's no difference. And so what I told him, I said, you know, every single miner of Bitcoin that I know of in the United States of America is either carbon neutral or close to carbon neutral. I really wish I could say that about every company in America. They will be in the future uh, with France technology, or at least they can, they can, uh, they can uh, find their way there. And part of that, by the way, is carbon offsets and how they get there. Right, but 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 part of the problem with with uh, with Bitcoin and the mining issues related to uh, energy are that the major producers or the major market share of of Bitcoin were co-producing countries like China and Russia. And guess what China and Russia have done in the last six months? They banned Bitcoin. By the way, it's not because of the environmental issues. I can tell you that much. It's because they can't control it. And so the major p- you know, dirty producer of Bitcoin mining has now banned Bitcoin. So they've given the United States, who is produ- you know, who's mining in a carbon neutral or close to carbon neutral fashion, a massive, massive uh, opportunity to do something that's good for the environment and good for humanity. And so, you know, we live in a world where people like to project out, particularly in, in environmental discussions. You know, we have hurricanes here. We have... Uh, uh, dry day flooding, and we have uh, rain bombs, right? But we have a hard time projecting where hurricanes going to hit five days out. And I love when people come and tell me, you know, Miami's going to be underwater by two, uh, 2100. I'm like, man, we can't even tell where a hurricane's going to hit in five days. I don't know how you can tell me what's going to happen in 100 years. But part of it is based on some flawed uh, mathematical analysis, right? If you if you just take history and you project it out, maybe those, maybe those statistics are, are, are valid and maybe they're real. And by the way, I'm not trying to diminish the concern. The concern is very real. And the concern, we, we, should be, we should feel like it's an emergency. We should act like it's an emergency because it is an emergency. But, but I fundamentally believe in human ingenuity. And I believe in those two young ladies who are out there and have that carbon capture technology. I believe in Fran and his uh, carbon exchange and climate coin. You know, I believe in the Tesla Prize winners, which were two other young ladies who came and did a cafecito tech talk with me, where they talked about how the, uh, you know, they designed these, this, this technology, sim- not too dissimilar from what you see out there, where container ships can rebalance the pH of the ocean slightly without harming the oceans to capture more carbon in a safe way and create a better homeostasis for our world. You know, we focus a lot on, on adaptation. We focus a lot on mitigation. But I'm I'm afraid that we don't focus enough on reversal. You know, we have to reverse the impacts of human uh, intervention. And I fundamentally believe in my heart and in my soul that we have the capability and the capacity to do it. And what that does is it disrupts those linear curves. Right? When you talk about, you know, uh, the the warming of the earth, which is very real and very scary. Right? If, If the current trends continue, we have to disrupt those trend lines. That's the only solution. It's not about mitigating. It's not about making it less hotter. It's about finding a way not to have that happen at all. Right? So uh, it's, it's going to be a fun journey for all of us to do it together. Um, the beauty of it is now, like I said, the environment and the economy are intertwined. So there's an economic case to be made for being good stewards of our environment. It's not just about saving ourselves, which should be strong, you know, strong enough of a motivation. Right? But now the metamorphosis or the merging of economics and the environment are now, are now creating the, the, the case study. So, 
you know, in Miami, we're eighth in the country or eighth in the world. I'm not sure which one of the two it is in green jobs. So it's important for us as an ecosystem, as an economy to continue to invest in a growing sector, in a sector that is going to continue to employ people at high salaries, little guys, right? The people of our community, the children of our community, the next, the next part of our community. So it's, it's incredible uh, to be here with you guys today. Um, it's, it's an exciting opportunity to talk about a subject that I'm extremely passionate about. I'm the only mayor in the United States that sits on the Global Council on Adaptation. Um, there's only two mayors in the world that sit on that council. It's myself and Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris. Um, and many of the other members are heads of state or heads of state level members. And so it's just incredibly uh, you know, fascinating, the world that we live in and the challenges that are before us. And while many people are afraid of that, and, and it's understandable because the, the uh, threats are real, I think we should all uh, look at it as an opportunity and as a challenge, right? And in a positive way that the decisions that we make, the risks that we take and what we invest in are gonna sustainably make a world that our children and our grandchildren can live in. In Miami, we call that Miami forever. And we also call it Miami for everyone. And so we need an America that's here forever. We need a world that's here forever and Premios Verde highlights the things that we're doing in the world and in this hemisphere, action that's being taken by you as individuals and companies and governments uh, to make that future a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Francis. La verdad es que quiero aprovechar el momento para agradecerle en nombre de Premios Verdes y de toda la comunidad de más de 18.000 proyectos registrados de 43 países del mundo, de 1.147 ciudades, la apertura de Francis desde el día 1 a Premios Verdes y al propósito de ayudar a los emprendedores, los Green Startups, a salir adelante. Así es que esperamos quedarnos muchos años más acá en Miami y que Miami no solamente sea el lugar que promueva los negocios sostenibles hacia el mundo, sino que los atraiga. Así es que muchas gracias y no sé si es que podemos dar espacio para un par de preguntas que estoy seguro que van a haber muchas personas que quisieran preguntarte algo. Que no, por supuesto. Yo sé. Muy buenos días, señor alcalde. Buenos días. Eh, mi nombre es Mari, vengo de Colombia, ah, Bucaramanga. Magnífico. ¿Qué ciudad? Acá. Exactamente, estamos ubicados en la localidad de Girón. Santander. Magnífico, magnífico. Gracias. Eh, tengo una inquietud, me gustaría llevar algunas ideas. Nosotros tenemos una empresa de reciclaje de plásticos okay. hace 37 años con mi esposo, Jaime. Mi inquietud es, eh, la ciudad de Miami tiene territorios pues, acuáticos, está rodeado de, como decimos, los negocios verdes y los negocios azules. ¿Cómo que no? Eh, las dos partes son muy importantes para la conservación. Yo sí. quiero llevar ideas para mi región. ¿Qué ideas podemos generar para recoger más los residuos sólidos? ¿Qué ideas podemos darle a las comunidades teniendo en cuenta que hoy día somos ampliamente consumidores de este tipo de, de plásticos sin que sea un problema, sino mejor brindar una solución para que el consumidor disponga de mejor manera este tipo de residuos. Nosotros eh, estamos comprometidos con la parte de la educación a partir de las generaciones presentes y las generaciones futuras, que creemos que podría ser una, una pequeña, un pequeño aporte para, para esto, pero me gustaría eh, tener sus ideas, tener un concepto que me pueda colaborar para seguir con este trabajo que, que es nuestra pasión, se ha convertido en nuestro estilo de vida. Gracias. Bueno. Bueno, muchas gracias por la pregunta. Yo creo que primero la educación es fundamental y yo creo que puede tener un impacto enorme, no pequeño. Yo creo que cuando uno eh, piensa del, del el enfoque de la próxima generación, o sea, de la manera en cual ellos eh, ponen este tema como tope de sus eh, temas de preocupación, yo creo que ya está funcionando eh, el, el, el énfasis en la educación, pero tenemos que continuar y hacerlo más comprensivo. Eh, a la misma vez, cuando yo he sido oficial electo por casi 12 años, nosotros introdu introducimos en esos 12 años el programa de reciclaje 
eh, de, de los hogares en nuestra ciudad. Así que nosotros eh, compartimos en, en esa tecnología, pero sin duda siempre se puede hacer más. Y en particular, eh, en respecto a nuestra bahía, eh, yo veo demasiado eh, personas que no, no cuidan a la bahía de la manera en cual deben de cuidarlo como si fuera su propia casa. Y yo, yo soy eh, un fanático de los deportes acuáticos, acuáticos y yo quiero que mi hijo pueda también disfrutar de esos mismos eh, deportes. Y si nosotros no cuidamos y preservamos eh, eh, ese, ese medio ambiente acuático, eh, él, él no va a poder disfrutarlo de la, de la misma forma que yo lo he disfrutado. Así que eh, mi, mi, mi despacho, mi oficina está aquí eh, para también intercambiar ideas con ustedes, si tienen ideas concretas en cual nosotros, nosotros somos un negocio grande, somos un negocio de mil, eh, 1.200 millones de dólares anuales, 4.500 empleados, más de medio millón de habitantes, eh, en, un, en una área metropolitana de 2.8 millones de personas. Así que con un presupuesto eh, en, en esa área de casi 10 mil millon, eh, millones de dólares. Así que eh, somos como un gobierno, somos como Colombia, <ríe> en cierto sentido. Eh, así que eh, eh, estoy rezando mucho por su país también. Muchas gracias. Una pregunta más. Yo, yo voy acá. Eh, una pregunta. Hola, ¿cómo estás? <ríe> eh, mira, me, me da curiosidad cuál es tu visión de... O sea, tenemos tecnología cripto a tope por un lado creciendo y es magnífica. Tenemos toda la sostenibilidad y proyectos increíbles acá creciendo un montón y con muchísimo potencial. Quiero ver cuál es tu visión del potencial de las dos combinadas de acá 4, 5, 10 años. Bueno, yo creo que los dos son eh, eh, vital para el futuro. Se tienen que combinar y lo que estamos viendo ahora es eh, el energía limpia como algo que puede eh, darle impulso a lo que es la tecnología de cripto moneda y, 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 y cripto, así que eh, eh, o tecnología nuclear o, eh, o hidro, o sea, hydrogen uh, power o, o solar o, o, de, o de wind farms, eso es algo que estoy viendo con mucha frecuencia casi todos los días, así que ya, ya el mercado lo está estableciendo y yo creo que como gobierno lo tenemos que reenforzar, no solo al nivel de publicidad, pero también si se puede hacer al nivel de de ayuda económica eh, para acelerarlo. Señores y señoras, Francis Suárez. No, no me lo voy a poner porque mi pelo es demasiado perfecto. Y el, el job que yo uso es concreto. Así que, pero concreto sostenible, pero muy bello, gracias. Me, me mandan muchas cosas, mira, esto me lo dio alguien también y casi nunca me lo pongo, pero en este caso sí me lo voy a poner porque es bastante lindo. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so we're ready to continue with today's uh, program. Not first, uh, wanting to thank on behalf of all of Premios Verdes organizers, uh, UN President Frank, for opening the university to us and letting us have this wonderful event here on this premise. I would also like to thank Dr. Felicia Knoll who's here present with us, professor and director of the Institute of Study of the Americas at UM, and first lady of the University of Miami. Thank you. Thank you. And we're ready to continue with our next talk. Uh, our next talk is uh, it's titled AT&T's Approach to Climate Resilience. It will be dictated by the Director of Global Environmental Sustainability at AT&T, 
In his current role, he focuses on identifying and implementing strategies and solutions around resource efficiency, renewable energy, and climate change. Around zero waste, large-scale renewable energy, and AT&T's climate change analysis tool. Over his 20-year career, he has, several he has had several roles covering compliance, project management, data operations, and supply chain. Please welcome to the podium, Shannon Carroll. So first, thank you all for not leaving after the mayor spoke. I appreciate that. Um, second, I have a confession. I took really good notes and wrote down really good speaker notes today. But after the last two presenters, I'm like, I can't do that. So if this goes all downhill, it's their fault, not mine. So I, I do want to talk to you about at and approach to climate change overall, including resiliency. Um, talk a little bit about my journey to get to kind of where I'm at right now. And the real thing I, I, I kind of want to get across, and we had a side conversation just a, a moment ago, and, and hopefully this resonates with, with people here, is, you know, I do represent at and I do work for at and I consider myself a sustainability professional first and foremost. And within this world of sustainability, environmental sustainability, not everybody can work for the EPA, not everybody can work for an NGO, nor do we want them to, right? We want them to work within the large corporations where you have sustainability professionals pushing the business to be as sustainable as possible. And really, that's, that's my role at at and Let's try another button. I have good slides, I promise. Oh, oh, there, there we go. So that's our overall approach, right? So we, we do take a very holistic approach. It's not one thing or another. Um, where the mayor is talking about the economy and environment here, it's the same thing, right? So when you talk about climate change, we, we just don't look at mitigation. We don't just look at adaptation. We don't just look at our own operations in terms of being more sustainable, reducing global emissions. We look outside of ourselves as well, and that's really important because, as our CSO Charlene Lake always says, you know, it doesn't do any good for AT&T to be climate resilient in a vacuum. I think that holds true with any of us, right? We need everybody to be climate resilient in order for this to kind of make a difference. So I want to talk in large part about these three components and really talk about what is the, the technology and the innovation that goes into those components, and maybe, um, more importantly for me, What's the sustainability catalyst that causes all this to happen, right? Because it really doesn't happen without that. So just carbon neutral, you know, the first thing. Again, the conversation was about everybody needs to be carbon neutral. We agree. Uh, the science says we need to be carbon neutral by 2050. at ts commitment is by 2035. There's also the conversation that Pip was having in terms of transparency. I like to say pretty much echo her the same sentiment, which is we're in an era of transparency now. You cannot say as a corporation or any entity that you're climate neutral and walk away. You have to prove it. And you know, I'm proud to say we've been proving it for a long time in terms of our transparency and reporting. So we report out on our global emissions every single year to multiple frameworks. For those of you who are in this community, you know how many frameworks there are. Um, so we'll have to demonstrate, we'll have to show that we're actually you know, doing what we say that we're doing. And for us, there's lots of different components, but it does come down to, to three major areas for us. First and foremost, it's going to be purchase electricity. At the end of the day, AT&T is a network company, connectivity, and it takes a lot of electricity to power that network. Um, so for us, a big piece of that is going to be renewable energy. And when you talk about renewable energy, I think it's interesting because what was innovative five years ago is no longer innovative today, and that's a good thing. I think one of the things we want to do is make sure that whatever is innovative today becomes commonplace tomorrow. So the example I'd give, and doesn't mean it's not still hard to do, it's just more widely accepted, more common. And I think a good example of that would be large-scale renewable energy, which is in large part how we're going to get to uh, being carbon neutral. And five years ago, there were folks doing it, but not in the way that they are today. And the technologies, obviously the innovations that allow companies to build these huge, giant solar and wind farms in order to put renewable energy into the grid. It takes you know, a lot of know-how to do that. Um, and as we mature along that spectrum, more and more companies will join. But I'm proud to say you know, AT&T's purchased, or we have 
capacity for 1.6 gigawatts of renewable energy. We only have about half of that up now, and we're already number seven on the EPA Green Power Partner list, which is an important list because you only get credit for the energy that you're generating. So a big way for us carbon neutral as well is gonna be around our fleet. We have thousands and thousands of vehicles, as you can imagine, everything from the big bucket trucks to the individual cars that go out to individual homes. Um, and we have committed to transition that to a, what we call a low or no emission fleet by 2035 as well. And that's really important and technology and innovation is gonna be key to make any of that happen. Because as much as we think EV is, is just, it's been around for a long time, right? It's just an easy solution. But sometimes we don't talk about is the infrastructure that's gonna be required to support fleets as large as AT&Ts and others. And that's where technology and innovation is gonna to have to come in. Things like hydrogen fuel cells, right? that's gonna be really important. So there's, again, all these constant connections between innovation and technology and tackling climate change. Also takes <clears throat> support from the top, right? And this is one of our leaders, Ann Chow, uh, a quote from her. As far as we're concerned, AT&T is gonna be part of the solution, right? I mean, we've, we've doubled down on that and we're gonna make sure that the products and the services that we sell are sustainable. And so a lot of that manifests itself in terms of, so I talked a little bit about how we're gonna re reduce our own emissions is reducing the emissions of others. And this is our gigaton goal. So we have a gigaton goal, which basically says we're gonna help reduce our customers' emissions by one gigaton of CO2e. And that's really, really important. And it's, it's one of those few goals, quite honestly, that a company like AT&T has set, and we don't know exactly how we're gonna get there, but that's important, right? That's where the sustainable professional comes in, maybe pushes a little more than we're always comfortable, is we don't have the perfect roadmap of how to get there, but we're really confident that we can. And how we're gonna do that is, is, again, transparently demonstrate through calculations, through things that are easily accessible on our website now, in terms of methodologies, how we are reducing our customers' greenhouse gas emissions. And it's not just about um, AT&T providing the connectivity, that's important, but it goes well beyond that, right? Innovation happens when you have collaboration, research, solutions, that ultimately disrupt what's happening today. So that's gonna be a, a major part of it for us as well. So think about smart climate solutions that are largely IoT, uh, big data, AI driven, that allow for real time monitoring of huge you know, energy consuming buildings, real time monitoring of your fleet, so you can make different decisions in order to reduce your emissions. This is gonna be a key part of how we accomplish that. Uh, we talked about support from the top for our company. It doesn't get any uh, higher than this. So it is important, and I think sometimes we take for granted as we look around the landscape, in particular for corporate sustainability, ESG, that every leader is signed up to do this, and that's not always the case. But I'm very proud to say that our leader has, and that really allows us the space that we need to operate within the business, because as you can imagine, <clears throat> as a self-proclaimed sustainability professional, I can't tell the network team what to do. I can't tell the corporate real estate team what to do, the supply chain team what to do. But what I can say is we have a mission and I have some ideas how to get there and making sure that we're meeting their individual goals as well to do that. So I'd like to play a quick video that really talks about our climate resiliency efforts. It's gonna say it better than I could. AT&T is building climate resilience and preparing for the challenges of tomorrow. In 1990, the U.S. had three disasters with damages totaling $1 billion each. In 2019, we were up to $14 billion disasters. That's why we're working with experts at the U.S. Department of Energy's Argonne National Laboratory to project how climate change will drive extreme weather in the future. Using data from Argonne's supercomputer, we can now see where utility poles are threatened by hurricanes or cell sites are at risk of flooding. These insights tell us where we need to take actions, like moving cables underground. More resilient equipment means we can deliver the services our customers need amid the extreme weather events that lie ahead. And better data means better decisions. 
As we build out our network across the country, we can now factor wildfire risk and flood projections into our design. We believe in helping others prepare for their own future climate challenges. So we are making our data available to everyone because it's not just about building resilient businesses. It's about building resilient communities and creating a better tomorrow today. Learn more at att.com slash environment. So um, what that video is, is now getting into, right, is climate adaptation or resiliency. So I've talked a lot about you know, reducing our emissions both within our operations, which is really important because you gotta take care of your backyard first. Also, how are we gonna reduce the emissions of our customers? These last few minutes, I'm just gonna spend on climate resiliency and self and, and, and how we address that because it's truly probably the most innovative uh, you know, thing that we've done as a corporation in terms of building climate resiliency. A lot of entities, what they do when they do their climate risk assessment, they get generally available climate data, which is good science, good data. But oftentimes what you'll get is at a regional level, maybe at a state level, and rarely at a city level. What AT&T did, thank you. What AT&T did is work with Argonne National Labs as part of the DOE, Department of Defense, who does most of the climate modeling for the US. We actually funded them to get climate data at what we call the neighborhood level. Because if you're going to execute on how to build a, a cell site, you know, more sustainable, you know, in a way that can adapt and, and prepare for climate change, you better have good data. Something more than says on average there's gonna be three feet of flooding in the southeast region of the US. So we have climate level, level data. Uh, for coastal flooding, it gets down within just a few meters. Uh, for inland flooding, we get down to uh, 200 meters. Um, and then where we need to, a little more space because of the science is really difficult. Um, in terms of drought, wildfire, wind, we can get within a 12 kilometer grid cell. But what that allows you to do is now make climate data decisions. So think about the infrastructure that we have. <clears throat> cell towers, and for most of you who work in particular neighborhoods, you see not only the cell towers, or if you live in neighborhoods, tr uh, traditional neighborhood, you'll see all the little green boxes everywhere. They vary in size, they do slightly different functions, but they're all susceptible to climate risks. And all the ones we talked about, flood, wildfire, drought, all of that. So now we have the ability, working with Argonne National Lab, and overlaying that into our GIS mapping systems, our global um, geographic information systems, just mapping systems. So you can now pull up a map with all of our infrastructure, click on that climate data, and now you have an overlay that tells you exactly where, where all the particular parts of the network is, is located. What's the risk to that? Three years ago, that was very innovative approach. But what we've realized now is that's not good enough. So we're innovating in new ways. And a lot of it is working with, continuing with Argonne National Labs and the business, right? Because we need the business to make these decisions. So it's not just saying to, uh, say, a, um, a network engineer who's putting up a, a new tower somewhere, some new fiber somewhere. It's not just saying, hey, by the way, there's gonna be three feet of flooding at this location. It's saying, instead of saying that, it's saying, hey, your climate risk at that location is now a four on a scale of one to five, right? So given the ability to do other things with the data as opposed to just presenting it in a straightforward way, is saying, well, here's the climate risk associated with this particular site, this particular location, this particular equipment, because you need a different risk for the water damage, the fire damage, the drought damage, and all of that. So this is an area where we're pushing ourselves and challenging ourselves to do more and more and more. The good thing is, uh, from my perspective, is very early on, we realized we were quite literally getting the best available climate data in the world at a, at a level, you know, 12 meters or 12 kilometers uh, within a few meters, depending on what it was. Do we keep that as a competitive advantage or do we send that out to the world? And very early on, we sent that out to the world and I like to say it's kind of the best kept secret. So the first thing we did was a pilot for the Southeast region of the United States, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina. And we have climate data right now on our website that's, downlit, that's downloadable for anybody, any research university, any municipality. They have the same data sets for the most part. They're giant data sets, so we have to make them um, usable. But the same data, data sets that we paid Argon to provide for us, we provide free to anybody who wants them. Now, the average person is probably not gonna download them and do anything with it, but again, think universities, municipalities. So the entire state of Florida including Miami, we have all those data sets and we 
provide those. And a big part of what we try to do is, again, look inward first, because you have to. It's okay, it's okay to be selfish from, selfish from that perspective, but then you have to look outward. So we are constantly working with different municipalities, different NGOs, different companies to promote the use of this data. Um, we are, I mentioned the pilot for four states, and I'll finish on this. We actually will have a complete data set for the contiguous 48 that covers all those climate risk areas that I mentioned before this year, and it'll be all downloadable to anybody who wants to use it. So again, any university, any municipality, any competitor, any utility, they can grab this data and hopefully prepare for climate resiliency in the way that we have. So hopefully I've connected some dots for you in terms of the importance of, of this work within you know, the corporate structure, the importance of the folks in this room who do sustainability as a living and maybe want to do sustainability as a living to push corporations to do more. And when we have that combination, this, these are the type of things we can uh, achieve. So I'll thank you very much and happy to take questions and maybe off to the side at some other point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon. Okay, so it's been great, right? We've been, we, we've been receiving so much wonderful information from all of our speakers so far. And our next speaker will be joining us online. He is the Managing Director of ESG in PWC's Consulting Solutions Practice. He has lived in the UK, the Caribbean, and the United States and brings his worldview to his engagements. He a keen sense that we are all in this together, that collaboration and cooperation are critical pre precursors to building the trust we need to solve the world's most important problems. He's an accomplished strategic leader and is passionate about leveraging digital information efforts to improve performance, accountability, and outcomes of client organizations, their stakeholders, and communities in which they operate. Please welcome Brian Henry with his talk, Trust, the Foundation of ESG Innovation. you could be there in person but if there's one thing the pandemic taught us is that remote ways of communicating uh, having systems that allow us to make decisions and collaborate effectively has definitely accelerated those so in a sense the pandemic has helped me trim my carbon footprint today so i feel like i'm doing my part uh, for the earth you know, it's really, really good to be here to have a conversation and to talk about some of the things that are critically important to us. Again, this is Earth Day. And uh, if the Earth ever deserved a day, uh, it's now. We all know the challenges. We're here talking about not just the ESG challenges at a broad level, but also in our communities and many of the efforts that are being celebrated here by Premios Verdes among the individuals and their communities and in their cities, some of those smaller efforts, all of which help us do the responsible and right thing. Among the things I'll be talking about today are some of the enablers that will help us to unlock um, the potential of sustainable climate tech for good. Wanted to talk about the fact that momentum is building. There certainly, we're beginning to coalesce around standards which will help us to take the actions that we need when it comes on to ESG rules. Wanted to also talk a little bit about the collaboration that we're seeing. You're seeing a lot of it at this conference and in your communities with NGOs and other groups, but also in other spaces. A lot of collaboration is happening to simplify the playing field and to accelerate the implementation of ESG standards. I'll talk about four actions that any organization can take in response to the IPCC um, panel on climate change, their findings, that working group, working group three, that was launched recently. Want to talk a little bit about how organizations are embedding climate action into their strategies and how technology is helping companies do that. And then last but not least, I'd spend a little bit of time on providing a little assurance that although the market seems fractured. There is so much being written. There is so much energy and passion and information about ESG that's out there. 
it can be downright confusing, if not intimidating, to assure you that you can make a, an individual contribution, you can make a company contribution or a community contribution that will certainly advance our journey. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and let's kind of get uh, into our presentation and we'll go from there. I'll share some slides with you. Okay, so we kind of talked about this, so I'll, I'll kind of move our way through the items that we'll be talking about. Wanted to spend just a little bit of time on these items. Uh, the eight key enablers that will help us to unlock the potential of sustainable climate tech for good. And some key things are, as you will notice, uh, you're seeing on the screen, leadership. I don't think that's something we can say too, too many times. Leadership is critically important. And the leadership, the responsible use of technology and being able to use public-private commitments, the partnerships that we have, the vision to keep going even when it becomes tough is going to be critical to us being able to achieve our goals. Of course, skills are critical and no organization has all the skills it needs and likely will never have them. So that is also unlocking the need for collaboration across sectors, between sectors, across industries, so that we can answer some of those difficult challenges we have in front of us. Finance plays a critical role as the third enabler because finance, we're seeing instances of that. We're seeing it around carbon credit trading platforms and other technologies where uh, they're being financed, they're being backed by private equity. And that is helping to drive and accelerate a lot of technology that is leapfrogging traditional systems and is getting us to where we need to be a lot faster. Of course, we talk about data and tools, and I noticed uh, in some of the conversations that preceded this, including the one by Shannon, that the ability to democratize data, to make data that is locked up behind firewalls, uh, so much data that's available that we could be using, we could be querying, we could be analyzing to unlock problems that we're facing, that if we can democratize those in a way that companies IP is protected, but yet that data is shared for the common good, it will certainly help us in various ways. It will give us the information we need to make good public-private data agreements. It will provide more seed data for the R&D agenda that we have so we can do more research on broader data sets that we can train on AI and machine learning um, so we can come to the answers we need much faster. And as we've kind of touched on, to push through the public policy updates that we need to make it easier for governments and other communities uh, to standardize the behaviors that we need to make the, the gains in decarbonizing our earth. Partnerships and coalitions, we'll touch on that one specifically with regard to some of these um, changes we're seeing and agreements that we're seeing uh, around uh, ESG commitments and around the rules of the game, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then responsible tech governance. I think in our lifetimes, we've all seen the impact of technology itself. It has a dark side. Um, when it comes on to show social media, it's created industries and products that we never thought could exist. But at the same time, if we're not responsible with the use of technology, it can have unanticipated and unwanted effects. And so we'll talk just briefly about that as well. But here's great news. We talked about that sense of urgency and agreement on a common set of rules. And let me start with the urgency. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their working group, that third working group, on April the 4th, told us what we really needed to hear, which was emissions, can peak by 2025, but then we need to have those emissions by 2030 in order to avoid the climate change scenarios that again, we just heard from Shannon and others. It is something that we have to do. So what does it mean in terms of time and urgency? We have very little time to baseline our carbon footprint 
and then to drastically begin to reduce it. Now, what's going to help us do that? Well, on the top of the slide, you'll see we talked about the SEC climate disclosure proposal that talks about scope one and two, but really gets into what will be required under scope three reporting. And it really settles the market down because now everyone knows what will be required. We won't, again, as has been said, it won't be enough to say I'm carbon neutral. We're going to have to dive deeply into the scope three, look at those supply chains upstream and downstream and be clear and specific about what we're reporting and it has to be of auditable quality, investigate quality. And then a week after March 31st, 10 days or so, the ISSB proposed two sustainability standards. One a more general sustainability standard and the other much more focused on climate change and that will provide the basis again for agreement on what needs to be done. One quick note, uh, it's an alphabet soup of agencies and standards boards and others. And there are several on this page and you'll see others in this presentation. Why is this so critically important? Well, I'll remind you, and I'll use an example using football or, or soccer, uh, depending on what you want to call it. Back in 1986, on June the 22nd to be exact, there was a great football match between Argentina and England. And you might remember a young, dashing 25-year-old Diego Maradona, uh, arguably the best football player the world had ever seen, certainly up until that point, put on a display. The second goal was one that uh, he scored that was maybe the greatest goal of all time. The first one, lots of questions about that. In fact, Maradona himself referred to it as the hand of God. If you ask even today, so many years later, millions of people will tell you that was a great goal and millions of others will tell you it was handball. That should not have counted. Why am I mentioning this in the context? Because referees, rules, fairness count. If we're on the field of play and we can't trust the rules or the officials, and we think that those are against us, we'll disengage. And that would be a critical mistake. So today, we have goal line technology to tell us if the ball did indeed pass more than half of it go into the goal. Now we have VAR, which is using 3D technology and high depth uh, HD cameras to let us know exactly whether or not the player was onside or offside. And a lot of that is being automated. Let us ride this way where we're using the arbiters, those the rules and the referees to make sure that we're holding people accountable to operate by a common set of rules so that none of us disengage in this most important journey. And again, more, uh, this slide is just here to talk about the fact that these referees, these arbiters, these associations of individuals who come together to standardize the playing field, to agree on the science and what those standards should be we need them to keep the field of play clear and so that those advances uh, can actually be documented. Now, here are the four actions we can take uh, in response to that latest IPCC report we refer to. The first thing is that we have to understand the potential impacts to our business across both physical and transition risks. And you heard that in the previous uh, um, presentation just a while ago. Uh, many companies are doing that as they have to. It's the right thing that they're doing for their internal populations and their stakeholders. Each company uh, owes itself, each organization needs to baseline its physical risk and the financial impact of that risk based on a variety of scenarios. The second thing that must be done is to use science aligned ways to decarbonize the business. So committing to science-based um, targets, using those science-based emission reduction targets and measuring your carbon footprint and using strategies aligned with those to make sure that what you're putting out there, what you're setting as a target is reasonable, it's verifiable, and it's auditable, i.e. can be trusted. The third thing, a theme that you've heard again today 
is to enhance resilience. So after having done the work of understanding the physical and transition risks inherent in this carbon heavy, heavy environment we live in, what are you doing to future proof and to reduce the vulnerability of your asset? And that may mean some operational changes, some philosophical changes. There may be some new opportunities for new lines of business or different ways of doing business that you're going to have to proactively look at today. And not just your business, but thinking about this uh, resilience of the supply chain is also critically important. There's one thing the pandemic has taught us is that we're only as good as our supply chain. And the last thing is to communicate transparently, openly, and freely to the market and other stakeholders. And that is why one of the areas where tech really plays a great role, because tech can help you to produce what we're calling investor grade ESG reporting. And it's not just a matter of reporting, it's a matter of measurement and baselining and tracking and understanding how is my organization doing in terms of meeting its net zero goals? Are we on track? Did we pick the right pathways? Are there unanticipated consequences? Are we not making the progress we should make? Then we have an opportunity uh, to be able to get back and look at it and change course. But the critical thing here is, is that we need to know where we are, what progress we're making, and communicate that effectively and transparently to the market. And that is something that will continue to increase confidence that the market has in us. Now, how do you do it? There's a lot of boxes on this slide, but I'd like you to just think about the ones where it talks about the key steps. Uh, we've mentioned one already, baselining. The second, strategy. The third, your roadmap. Now, based on that strategy where you literally put your objectives on a timeline and define those to a, to a degree of specificity. And then you figure out how you're going to operation, operationalize and implement those strategies. And then you're going to report out internally and externally uh, to both um, to all of your stakeholders as well as to others on how you're doing. If you look at the building blocks on the, each of those phases, shall we say, uh, the, the ones that are highlighted are the ones where tech plays a, a massive role. In terms of baselining, data. There's nothing like benchmarking. Not just your own performance, but med benchmarking against your peers across your sector. In terms of strategy, you gotta do a materiality and risk assessment, which again, uses tech and data to give you the baseline information you need and give you some of the answers, help you set the targets that you're driving towards. In your transformation roadmap, you're looking at what your levers are and how you prioritize what you need to accomplish. And then you'll eventually also look at how you finance and build capability uh, so that you can deliver on those roadmap items. One of the very interesting phases is the fourth one how you operationalize and implement. And that isn't just about bolting ESG on to everything else you do as a, as a company. It's about understanding how ESG transforms the way you operate. It impacts the governance and the culture of your organization. It impacts your business processes and, and how you integrate internally. And it has a strong impact on your technology backbone so that when you're making business decisions, when you're planning and when you're executing, you understand the ESG impact of each of those in close to real time. And then of course, on the reporting and communication, it's heavily tech enabled. But if you've done step four correctly, step five is frankly pretty easy to do. So again, five main steps on how you can go from that vision to actually executing, measuring, and going into your continuous improvement loop. I'm not gonna go through these, but I wanted to share this with you. That in terms of the digital solution landscape, there are a lot of technologies which have made a lot of progress, 
whether it's ERP systems, ESG reporting solutions, GHG management systems, or others, you'll see a lot of names that you'll, uh, you will have, um, be familiar with and maybe others you've never heard of. In other words, the ESG journey is on the way. Companies are making progress. Collaboration is taking place across multiple industries to pull together the products we need to help us be clear on making ESG progress in our corporations. So those are some. The marketplace is huge and is growing. And that's one of the things that struck me, is that the more we care and the more we read is the more there is to learn, is the more data there is for us to be analyzing and collecting and reporting out on, and the more tools and solutions that there appear to be. This can very easily become a source of um, fear, can be overwhelming, can put you in a position where you're not sure where you want to start. So we're just going to bring it right back to the basics. How do we begin to use climate tech for good? What does that process look like, no matter what we do? Well, you'll see it here in the four steps that we've laid out in front of you. Your requirements and benchmarking is critical. Where am I? How did we get here? What's our carbon footprint? What do we need to do? Do we understand the business workflows and what those workflows are producing and how those workflows uh, um, uh, impact our carbon footprint? So we do that. We do the risk assessments and we know where we are and what we have to do. Then we go through the gap analysis space. What do I need so that I can either measure more effectively or begin to make the changes to decarbonize, to move away from to pick the pathways away from heavy carbon content to decarbonizing how I operate my business, to looking at other solutions and other ways of, of doing my business. And that may mean talking to vendors, with, whether it's with RFIs or RFPs, et cetera, uh, to get the, uh, the additional technological assistance you need. Once you've gotten those responses on the third step, then you have the ability to prioritize on what you would like to. What are your priorities? What's going to give you the biggest bang for the buck in terms of decarbonization and understanding your carbon footprint and your supply chain footprint and being able to reduce that carbon in the shortest period of time? And then you prioritize accordingly. And doing that may be ending up with one or two key solutions that will help you get there. And then it's a matter of implementation. And we're not just talking about you know, putting in new IT systems or technologies. We are talking about retooling and upskilling your entire operation so that you're working in an ESG aware manner. That includes the tools, the governance, the controls, the change management, the training, the education, and the continuous improvement. So I guess the question really is, is it possible for us to make continuing progress with our ESG goals in a world where there is so much climate tech and so much of it is so new and emerging and growing? I think the answer to that is yes, we can. There's a pathway to get us to where we want to go. The key is, is to start today. And if we start today, we benchmark our journey. We talk about where we are and what we'd like to accomplish. And you have partners like ourselves who are certainly happy to have conversations with you and talk to you about what you can be doing better. Then we can look forward to a time when we're talking about how much, how much more quickly we can accelerate decarbonization and what do we need to, rather than what we need to do to start our journeys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Okay, so we continue on this filled day with our Climate Tech Day. Our next speaker co-founded Climate Coin in 2017 and later Climate Trade in 2018. 
The Climate Trade Marketplace recently received the UN WTO Prize for the world's best decarbonization of the travel industry solution. ClimateCoin received the prize for the best solutions of, for new carbon marketplaces markets for post-2020 by the UN in the World Economic and Social Survey in 2018 report. His purpose is to create an organization focused on sustainability and based on disruptive technologies and systems that can tackle climate change and SDGs exponentially. Please welcome to the podium Francisco Benedito with his talk, Leverage the, Leveraging the Power of Blockchain for the Large-Scale Decarbonization. Thank you, everyone, and thanks for the Premios Verdes, Jose Javier, and everyone to, uh, of the team for inviting us here today. It's great to be in Miami. It's our new house. We just moved to Miami and, and to the U.S. as a, a, our whole company, organization. So very happy to be here these days. And it was great to hear my, my friend Francis before. And uh, I normally, I, which is a person that I very admire, I, I hope, and, and I really see that he will be a president of the United States at some point sometime in the future. So we agree in two things. We admire, both of us admire strongly to our parents, our father. And second thing, I don't like my hair to be cut. So <laughs> that's great. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about climate tech. We've been leading innovation on the space since 2016. My partner Jose here, my partner Pedro, uh, who co-founded with me the company in 2017. We launched ClimateCoin. People, it was too early then. I remember going to San Francisco everywhere and talking about climate change. They were frank, I really like you, I, I like your suit. I don't believe in climate change, no? Now the story is totally different. Everyone is on this uh, and the, the narrative changed completely and we are in the right moment and uh, I'll, I'll explain you some things about climate coin later. So, but today I'm focusing on what we did with climate trade, which is the leading marketplace for carbon offsetting worldwide using blockchain technology. So f I think that the best way to explain you is with a short video that uh, will permit me to, to start better with my presentation. You are here. Time is running out. On the brink of a new era that finally brings technology in line with our planet's needs. Meet climate trade. Climate Trade is the first climate marketplace that enables companies to take direct action in the fight against global warming like never before. Our platform brings together the biggest sustainability projects in the world and guarantees investment and in real cross-cutting impact contributing to the SDGs. These investments allow our clients to meet their environmental commitments by offsetting their carbon footprint. Our API also allows complete integration with our clients' platforms so that their users can also offset their emissions and at the same time reinforce their corporate social strategy. Blockchain is the transactional revolution that has opened the doors to a fairer world and is the technological driving force chosen by Climate Trade for its unprecedented traceability of operations, removal of bureaucracy, and commitment to transparency. You are here on the brink of a new era that finally brings technology in line with our planet's needs. Join us for this transformation. Thank you, thank you so much. So, uh, I keep on telling that the video is outdated because we have already offset more than three million tones around the world. But basically, I don't know, but my, my team is doing that all the time. But anyways, so basically, uh, we are the first climate marketplace in the world. And what that means is that we are not just selling offsets to corporations, because what we do is we help corporations to achieve carbon neutrality, but also to mark their strategy towards that carbon neutrality, net zero. So companies mark their strategies, like you know now, 
Uh, we come from Europe, and, and there is a strong regulation already for reporting. Now, SEC, you know, is already marking companies, hey, you have to report sustainability. So you have to mark a strategy towards 2050. Obviously, you are not going to put it at the top 2050. So imagine 2030, 2025, 2040, uh, depending on the, the type of companies and how big their emissions are, are. No. So basically what we do is we help corporations to understand how to tackle this, how to promote, how to make that strategies, and where are the best products, sustainable products to do, and also doing in setting and doing internal practices to improve and reduce that emissions. No. So basically our marketplace, it was created in 2017 with the idea that the carbon markets were inefficient, non-transparent, and they were like, basically, there were problems in efficiencies like double counting. You didn't know where your money was going. You didn't know if the, if the developer of a portal of a project that generates carbon credits was receiving the money or not. So imagine that the brokers were taking all the, all the cat out of the transaction more, 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 most of the times. No? So basically we said, okay, what can we do? So I was working as a banker for 15 years and I was one of the early blockchain experts in the European Union. So we said, okay, why don't we apply blockchain to climate? Like there was a question before, crypto and climate, of course. So what we did is say, okay, if we provide with transparency with blockchain and traceability to do that, to that we can tackle the problems that are double counting for credits or that we don't know where the money is going. It's going to the developer, it's going to the broker, where the money is going. No? So basically today, we are the leading one on voluntary, and we also integrated the mandatory market in the UETS, which is the 60% of the global transactions for climate. So we are the first company in the European Union that integrated in their platform already the mandatory market, and we will integrate in several marketplaces around the world. Now we are in the US, and we are going to be growing in the US in that sector also. So basically, what is important about blockchain? The blockchain has to be non-contaminant, so that's why we use Algorand. We help Algorand, we create a new algorithm, so Algorand, whenever it generates a block, there is an, uh, there's a possibility to offset that transaction automatically. Like, we have a green treasury where you go and you just pick up the, the, the offsets and automatically compensate the transaction. No? That's why Algorand is carbon negative, thanks to our API, thanks to that technology. No? So basically, you need to do it because you need to redu reduce costs, you need to increase the speed of transactions. Listen, Acciona, which is one of the leading companies in the world for sustainability, they came to us and said, Frank, it's taking two months to make a carbon offset transaction, like traditional, like contracts, reviewing by legal. With us, it's five minutes. You get in the platform, sign up, you have your dashboard there, you make a card, pay with PayPal, transfer, or credit card. That's it, you get it. Next time, you have your transactions in your dashboard, so every company can look at in five years and know where they bought, at which price, how many tones, to which developer, everything in one place. Because if not, imagine it was like calling brokers, oh, I don't remember which broker did I buy this, you know? So do you have everything in one place? And obviously traceability. I can know how much money I'm sending to my pocket as climate trade, how much money we are, we are earning, but how much money is earning the developer, which is the most important person. He has to generate more projects. He has to receive the fair price for their project and for the efforts they are doing. No? So that's important to know. We record everything in blockchain for this. So basically, uh, today we've created the first NFT also for whenever you make a transaction in climate trade, you receive the certificate for your offset. And then we have it also put in an NFT so you can have it in your wallet. It was the first time to be done. And it was done recently, together with the green treasury for Algorand also. So basically, what we have in the platform are, like, in one side, developers of projects, in the other side, corporations all around the world. We just put them together. We are not brokers. We just are facilitators. So basically, we have more than 60 projects available today. Uh, there are hundreds around that we know of that they are not still in the platform, but we are now in conversations with pretty much 15,000 projects around the world that will be soon, not, I hope the 15,000, but it will be difficult, but probably 1,000, 1,500 in the coming months. So we are growing that part with all types of projects with different uh, standards, but only certified projects. It has to be clear that it's very important that you need to have auditors that certify that that project is fair, 
that that project has, it takes care of what it has to take care of. No? It has to capture or it has to generate a project that uh, it has the SDGs involved around the project. And it has like all the quality standards necessary, like complement, already complemented. No? So we work with SGS, we work with Gold Standard, the UN, Behrein, and all the different American Carbon Registry, and all the standards that we, that says that the quality project is there, no? the quality of the project is there. Uh, well, basically, all our projects have to have the SDGs involved. How do I measure if that project is not only carbon capture, is capturing CO2, but it is doing something for the community? And I put you an example. We are supporting one project in Peru, in the Madre de Dios area, there is a devastated area by the gold mining. It's very intensive on that. So the community, they are conservating Brazilian nuts trees. So just selling the nuts, they cannot survive. So they sell offsets. They conserve that area. They avoid people going and cut up the trees and make gold mining. And they create the schools, hospitals, and they survive as a community, no? Because, uh, so together with that, in 2018, when I was flying to the COP, we are sponsors of the COP already since 2017. So I was going to Bonn, and I was flying with Ryanair. And they say, okay, do you want to pay five euros for offsetting? Yeah, let's try what they are doing. No? I pay five euros. I didn't know where my money was going. I didn't receive any certificate, any email, nothing. So it wasn't scammed. I was scammed. So I was mad, and I say, okay, we have to change this all over. No? So what we said is, okay, we want to certify my transaction as an end user, as an individual. And for doing that, I need to create an API. So we created the first carbon API worldwide. So today, with our API, I can offset electronics, I can offset transportation, we offset blockchains, and everything from the B2C perspective, individuals. Because when we started, we call it democratization of climate change. The individuals, we have the voice, we have to put that on the table. So it is important, the API, why? Because we don't only say, hey, we sold you the carbon. No, we tell you which carbon, we tell you how much is your CO2 that we offset, how much did you pay, and we certify it to you, and we put it in blockchain. And we certify by one of the biggest certification companies in the world. That's transparency. You know where your money is going. If you pay one euro, I don't, or one dollar, or two dollars, or 0 0.5 dollars, you want to know that your money is making positive impact. If not, what else? So. Basically, uh, together with that, we create a widget so you can take uh, the code, put it in your website, and you can imagine a small travel agency. Get the code, put it in your website, or put it in your internal system, your, your, your individuals, your people that go to book a travel, they can offset the carbon footprint. Calculate and compensate. So this is one of the, certi it, it would be one of the certificates if we move it this way, but uh, it is a type of certificate that we issue for the, for the individuals. And these are all companies we work with. Lavazza, Santander Bank, already for more than three years working with Santander. We started the business in Spain and now we are more in more than five countries. Uh, we are opening in Seoul, in South Korea. We are opening in Japan, Tokyo, United States, Miami, and New York soon. And yeah, the idea is growing climate trade in some of the biggest cities in the world, some of the biggest countries on, in the world. Next step, Germany also. So pretty much we hope this year to offset more than 20 million tons of CO2. Uh, for example, just Santander, we started with them three years ago. When we started with Santander, they came to us, hey, can you help us with the strategy for carbon offsetting? What have we, we have to do? What is the strategy towards the next years? So we helped them to find the right offsets to set up that strategy. And today, next week, we are launching worldwide a system where you go to your app website of Santander and you can calculate your card statements and compensate them right away and receive a certificate to your email. So that's gonna be done with Santander and two more, two more banks that we are in conversations now. And we hope to do it also with our partnerships group that has 120 banks behind. So we hope to do it pretty soon also. We have advisors such as <coughs> Juan Verde, former advisor of Obama. We have also advisors such as Javier Manzanares which is the CEO of Climate Coin that I tell you later. It will be announced tomorrow. Tomorrow is the big party of Climate Coin here in Miami. So Javier Manzanares is the former CEO of the Green Climate Fund. 
Those of you that don't know about the Green Climate Fund, Green Climate Fund is the biggest environmental fund in the world, managing more than 100 billion, and they put that money for the government at work to generate sustainable projects. He just left the Green Climate Fund, he's gonna be the new CEO, co-CEO with my partner Pedro of Climate Coin and Green Climate DAO, which is what we are launching tomorrow. Our team today is more than 45 people around the world, direct, in-house, in, in <laughs> and outsource more than 45 more, and growing, no? I hope we will be, I think we will be more than 100 people before the end of the year. Uh, well, as they mentioned, 2018, we were recognized by the UN as the best solution in the world for the carbon markets. And that in the corner, in 2021, uh, we were awarded by the UN WTO as the best API for the travel industry. So we have today more than 2 million tons of CO2 offset, will be more than three today, more than 500 corporates in the platform, big corporations, but also all types of companies, and more than 2,700 uh, individual users coming from the API that we help them also to, to be sustainable. Well, our, our roadmap, we hope this year to, to have more than 5,000 customers. We are introducing in the coming months, energy section, so you will be able to also to buy IREX, Greenies, and guarantees of origin all around the world. And also the carbon finance section, which is another thing that I, I will um, be later. And well, case studies, as I told you, we have created the first digital MRB for generating real-time carbon offsets. How do we do this? We created in Europe a blockchain carbon registry with six group, which is the biggest financial group in Europe, so basically what we do is we connect solar plants. It was a POC, but we created that we can connect with forestry through drones and satellites. We do it with agroforestry, AFOLU. We do it with mangroves. So we can select and we can generate in real time with digital MRB. We introduce there the certification company, register it, and put it on sale on climate trade, real time. So we did a test with solar because obviously the inverters and the smart meters is easier to do and now we are progressing to do it with other systems. And basically, corporate events with Iberia and all that are carbon neutral thanks to us. With Iberia, once you get up a, grab a flight before COVID, that the COVID came and screw up everything. But <laughs> so, and then we do it with Cabify, which is the, if, if you guys don't know, is like the uh, Latin American and Spanish Uber. So <laughs> we do with them real time calculation of the ride and compensation in real time and certification for you. And this is important. I don't know if you heard about scope three. Uh, every company has three scopes, scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. Scope three is, I, I like to call it third parties. Your employees, your providers, your customers. If they don't compensate, you have to do it for them. It's your carbon footprint as a corporation. So which is this important because I don't know how many people here has their own companies, but when I go to have a dinner or a lunch, I have to pick up the ticket to give it to my accountant in my, in my company because obviously you have to make taxes later, no? And this is the same for CO2. Everything, everything is gonna be carbon labeled. Every product that you may know today, a bottle of water, the plastic, everything will have the CO2 mark, CO2 label. So basically this is important because you have to aggregate all that CO2, bring it to the guy of your company that's gonna take care of the reporting and you have to know how much your employees are contaminating around. How do you come to the, the work? Do you come by bag? Do you come by bus? Do you come by a big car? So it needs to be measured. So we do that with electronics also, as I told you. You buy a device, calculate and compensate, and receive a certificate. We do that with hotels. We just closed in Mexico. All hotels in the Rivera Maya are gonna be calculating and compensating every single booking that they go there. It's gonna be announced next week. And also, it comes climate coin. What is climate coin? Climate coin, it was 2016, uh, it was created as an idea of being the first crypto asset in the world that tokenizes carbon. We launched it in 2017, and today it's gonna be the first regulated in the US regulated asset that tokenizes carbon. It's gonna be a digital representation of a carbon credit, so individuals can buy it and hold it in their hands and can support projects all around the world, certified and verified, but all legal or regulated, and that's important, 
because you know that today, the United States normally, you cannot buy crypto as a, if it's a security normally. So it is important that because this is a financial product, so you have to have it regulated because if not, it's, not, it's gonna be in trouble, you know? So uh, basically that's it. We are, that's our theme, we're leading global, our global change. And yeah, I hope that uh, you guys uh, are enjoying Premios Verdes. We are in the board uh, since already two years. My partner Jose here because he's better than me on climate. So basically uh, we are very happy to be in Miami. Uh, we hope to be now uh, like more involved in everything related to climate, both climate coin and climate trade. And I always like to say that climate solution is about small efforts by all of us, but they have to generate positive impact. So we need to look also and always the impact that we are generating in our actions. That's basic. It's not a public solution, it's a pri public, private, but also individuals one. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francisco. That was very enlightening. So are we ready for the last talk of the day, our master class? We can't go on without thanking our sponsors. So I'd like to take a little moment to acknowledge them. And building these activities benefiting the sustainability of startups and entrepreneurs is possible thanks to the support of Algorand, the city of Miami mayor's office, the municipality of Guayaquil, the United